Welcome to episode 260 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my award-winning books, blog, and podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent John Antisev, who served in the FBI for 28 years. In part one of this two-part episode, John takes us behind the scenes as he reviews his investigation into the 1990 murder of Rabbi Kahan by El Sahid Nassar and into his operation of an FBI confidential source who infiltrated an operational cell of Egyptian Islamic radicals. The cell's spiritual leader was Sheikh Amar Abdel Rahman, also known as the Blind Sheikh. Members of this group, including Ramzi Yosef, were later found to be responsible for the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center. John worked this case with his Joint Terrorism Task Force JTTF partner, New York Police Department Detective Louis Napoli. John speaks openly and transparently about the stress and the frustration he endured during the six-year FBI internal investigation into his and others' handling of the confidential source who, unknown to John, had recorded many of their conversations. After the 1993 World Trade Center attack, John engaged his source to penetrate a second operational terrorist cell preparing to attack the Lincoln and Holland Tunnels, the United Nations, 26 Federal Plaza, and other New York City landmarks. This time, the case, known as Terror Stop, resulted in the prevention of major attacks and identified links between the cell and a hostile intelligence service. Fourteen participants in the plot were convicted of seditious conspiracy, including Sheikh Rahman and El Sahid Nassar. John is a certified crisis negotiator, police instructor, and adjunct professor at the FBI Academy. He is a recipient of the FBI Director's Award, Federal Law Enforcement Foundation Investigative Excellence Award, CIA Intelligence Award, and Respect for Law Enforcement Incorporated Achievement Award. He is also a member of the NYPD Honor Legion. Currently, John works for the Safan Group and as a contractor conducting background investigations for the Bureau. You can read a longer, detailed bio for John at jerrywilliams.com in the show notes for this episode. Before we get to the interview, please give me a moment to tell you about my father, Buford Williams, who died at age 87 on May 6. A friend of mine recently said, you only really die when people stop remembering you. So help me keep my father's memory alive by reading about him and his 21 years of service in the Air Force in the post on my website and social media. I want to thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, John Antisev. Hey, John, how are you? Good afternoon, Jerry. How are you? I'm doing great. I have been after you really for almost a couple of years, and you are a very, very busy man. We were able to finally get this interview scheduled, and I'm thrilled. I think there are a lot of people who are not aware of the beginning of all of the conflict that ended up being 9-11. And I saw somewhere that the case that we're going to talk about today was a dress rehearsal to what happened in 9-11. Would you characterize it that way? Yes, I would. The roots of uh, what happened on 9-11 actually started, if you go back to 1979, which was an important year in history, that was the beginning of the Soviet conflict in Afghanistan. So it goes yeah. back further back than 1993. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, I think if we want to start off on how the case developed, since this is a case review, let's start off with uh, when I got to the JTTF in about late 1989. When I got to the JTTF in 1989, it was really only two squads made up the JTTF. There was a domestic squad and an international squad, which I was on. And then there was also uh, a third squad, but it really wasn't part of the JTTF. It was a squad that handled uh, state-sponsored terrorism. My squad, the International Terrorism Squad, at that time in 1989, had only about 20 people on the JTTF. It was comprised of about 10 detectives and uh, 10 FBI agents at the time. As compared to today, where I think the JTTF may now have 20 squads and upwards of 500 people. So oh, wow. imagine how small it was then. Yeah, I had no idea it was that large. And again, this is all in New York, in New York City. Yes, yeah. When I got there, I was partnered up with a New York City detective, another guy from Brooklyn like myself, Louis Napoli. We were a good match together. But being that the squads were so small, back then our portfolios were pretty big. Lou and I handled all the terrorist groups that were in North Africa, including many of the Palestinian programs, including groups like the DFLP, PFLP, PLF, Abu Nidal, Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. So we had a pretty big portfolio at the time. But we were also looking closely at some of the Egyptian terrorist groups. We were working on a group called Al Gama, Islamia, and the Egyptian Islamic Jihad. And at that time, we came upon information that had been circling around the community that mosque and a, I guess if you call it a, uh, a center called the Al Kifa Refugee Center, they had put out a call to civilians to come fight in the jihad against the Soviet Union. So, Lou had a, a source in the vicinity of the mosque or in the Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn area. He reported to Lou that several folks from the mosque had asked him if he knew where to get ammunition for AK-47 rifles. And when this source asked, well, how much ammunition are you looking for? The guy said, well, we're looking for about 20,000 rounds a month. Today, we would call that gathering intelligence. Back in 89, we called that a clue as an investigator. Absolutely. So we yeah, something, so we something's up. This is a lot of ammunition for this group of people. So we started to look into it. But even back then, you just couldn't even open up a case without any predication. We knew that people were traveling to Afghanistan to fight for the Mujahideen. And we also had a statute. It was against federal law for U.S. persons to go fight in foreign wars. So we used that predication to open up a case to at least take a look at this uh, phenomenon that was going on with this concept of foreign fighters at the time. We really didn't have a handle on it. What we also found was, subsequent to that, was that there were a lot of posters and flyers circulating around Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn, which was basically a call to training, asking people to come to the al Kifa Refugee Center and to sign up for firearms training, and that it was legal, and that it would be good to participate in uh, fighting in Afghanistan. So what we did was we started to task our SO team SO9, which was part of the JTTF, to do some surveillances of some of those firearms training. In the meantime, before we started to do all the surveillances and stuff, we just started to try to get some peripheral information about what was happening at the mosque and what the al Kifa Refugee Center was all about. And it was a movement started by an individual named Abdul Azam. And when the war broke out, Instead of keeping the fight local between the Afghans and the Soviet Union, he organized a group to persuade Muslims from around the world, whether it be from the Arabian countries or from Indonesia or anywhere that Muslims were, that it was their duty to fight in this jihad against the Soviet invaders. We were able to, at that time, develop what I like to call peripheral sources at the mosque and at the al Kifa Refugee Center, just to give us that sort of situational awareness of what was going on. 
We also found out what airline they were using and who was going and for how long they were going. We really couldn't get much more. The inner circle of the leadership of that group was pretty well insulated at the time. Our information at that point was limited. Also, we were getting a lot of decent photographs, and you could see it on the stuff that I sent you, good surveillance pictures of people that were participating in the firearms. They would normally go on a Saturday or Sunday. They would meet outside the Farouk Mosque on Atlantic Avenue, and they would go to one of three public firearms ranges around the area. Most predominantly, they would go to a firearms range out in Cavalton, Long Island. They would go to upstate New York, and they would go to Connecticut. All of this training, and I'm looking, and I hope we'll be able to share with listeners, it's a kind of a hand-drawn flyer call mm-hmm. to training. But this yeah. training, is, according to the flyer, is for training to fight in yes. Afghanistan. Nothing is for fighting or to use those firearms against American citizens here in the U.S. No, not at all. At this point, this is all about recruiting what we call today foreign fighters. If you look at the surveillance photos going back to those early days, you'll see surveillance photos of people at the range. Some of the most interesting photos from 89 are actually captured three future cellmates that will take part in the World Trade Center bombing in 93, unbeknownst to us in 89. We're trying to just explore what's happening with this group that's participating in the training. We're having trouble developing sources that are organizing the training. We're just getting information from fellow attendees at the mosque about what's happening, about the training. We're starting to develop a decent beginnings of a good database on what's happening. There's one photo here. You'll see a car at the range out in Carrollton with the license plate showing. We ran that license plate and it belonged to a young man who was going to a local college. Believe it or not, he was in the last stages of becoming an FBI translator. We wow, interviewed that's him. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And that group turned out to be the group that was going to bomb the Trade Center in 93. So just by sheer luck, we found this person and he had no past history or record. He might have gotten in, but we prevented him from getting the job. We tried to appeal to his sense of uh, duty since he wanted to work for the FBI, but it turned out that he didn't want to help us sort out what was happening at the refugee center. Well, let me ask you, did he really want to work for the FBI? Was he doing it because he wanted a job or was he trying to infiltrate the FBI? At this point, I don't know. He's a young guy. He was probably enamored by the whole fighting for Islam overseas against the government of the Soviet Union. He probably thought it would be exciting. I don't want to say that he was a knowing terrorist trying to infiltrate at this time because we were never able to actually prove that. But it would have put him in a compromising position had he gotten that job later on. These things are all going on at the same time. And then what happens is a couple of major things happen. In 1990, the uh, spiritual leader of the Al-Gama Islamiyah and the Egyptian Islamic Jihad arrives in the United States, and everybody knows him as Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman. they also known as the Blind Sheikh. He comes, he's actually sponsored by the al Kifa Refugee Center to come to the United States and take over responsibilities, not only there, but also at the El Salam Mosque in Jersey City. Several months after that, that's in May, by November 5th, 1990, One of the congregation, one of the organizers of the firearms training, a guy by the name of El Saeed Nosser, a devout follower of Rachman, actually assassinates Rabbi Meyer Kahani. Rabbi Meyer Kahani is the full field subject of an FBI investigation himself. Meyer Kahani is the founder and the leader of the Jewish Defense League. It's uh, considered a domestic terrorist group. And it was being investigated by the FBI New York office at the time. And this assassination occurred here in the U.S.? Yes, it occurred right here at a hotel in Midtown. I believe it's the Sheraton Hotel on Madison Avenue. He was giving a speech to his followers, and the speech was infiltrated by Il Said Nosser and two other accomplices. Nosser was listening to him speak. When the speech was over, it was a small room. It wasn't 
it was like a, a huge meeting room at the as a conference room. Maybe you could fit 75 people comfortably. At the end of the speech, people usually go up to the rabbi, shake his hand, maybe slip him a couple hundred bucks as a donation. And you know, Sarah was in the crowd and he went up to shake the rabbi's hand. But instead of shaking his hand, he had a 357 Magnum Ruger at his side. He shot from the hip and he struck Kahani in the throat and tried to run out of the uh, conference room. One elderly gentleman tried to stop him. He was about 72 years old at the time. Nosir shot him in the leg and then proceeded to run out of the hotel into the street where one of the folks from the photographs, a guy by the name of Mahmoud Abu Halima, was supposed to be waiting for him. He was a cab driver, was supposed to be waiting for him in a cab as a getaway car and blend into traffic, you know, yellow cab. But in all the confusion, Nosir's elevated state of fear, he jumped into the wrong taxi. He winds up commandeering that taxi at gunpoint, only to be chased out the door by 25 or so people. The taxi didn't get far because it got stopped at a traffic light and heavy traffic. Nosir jumped out of the car while being chased by people from the hotel, and he stumbles across a postal police officer. I don't think I've ever seen a postal police officer on the streets of New York. He was just happened to be closing up a small annex post office there. And him and Nosir come face to face. Nosir shoots the postal police officer right in the chest with the 357. Thankfully, the postal officer was wearing his bulletproof vest. He was saved by that. I believe his name was Acosta. He returned fire and struck Nosir in the neck. That happened on the evening of November 5th, 1990. Of course, the JTTF is not a 24-7 hour operation. So it was a major event in Midtown Manhattan. The police responded. The first thing they did was they went to the detectives from, I want to say 17 Squad, took control of the case as a murder investigation. That was a violent crime squad? It was just a regular homicide squad from Manhattan plus the precinct squad. So this is the NYPD squad. I thought you were saying an FBI squad. Yeah, no, right? Because this was in the evening. So the first responders are always going to be the NYPD in a situation like that. So they did a search warrant at Nosir's house when he was identified. And they wound up seizing 24 boxes of evidence from his Jersey City home. The next morning, when I went to work, Myself and Lou Napoli were assigned by my supervisor on the JTTF to go take a look at what was happening with this murder, since it involved an Egyptian guy who may or may not be known to us at the time, and the founder of the Jewish Defense League. And of course, other agents that were working the Kahani case were also involved with the case at that point. The NYPD had the boxes and the evidence for several days. Then it was transferred to the Manhattan DA's office, and we were able to get a look at those boxes for only about three days. There was 24 boxes of stuff. A lot of stuff was in those boxes, including things like tapes of Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman giving speeches. There was also books about police procedures. There was books about doing things like car stops and searching houses the way a police squad would do it. He seemed to be interested in all that kind of stuff. One of the most interesting things we found in the boxes was manuals from the U.S. Special Forces in Fort Bragg, Special Warfare School, outlining small unit tactics. We found that this was used by Special Forces to train their operatives around the world. We would later conclude after 9-11 when the U.S. military was fully engaged in operations over there, that many of the manuals that the Taliban and Al-Qaeda were using were derivatives of these actual manuals that Nosir had in his possession that were sent into the pipeline and translated. And we found out by backtracking that these manuals were stolen by a sergeant assigned to the special forces. His name was Ali Muhammad. He was a former Egyptian army officer who left Egypt, came to the United States, joined the U.S. Army, but he couldn't become an officer, but he was able to become an enlisted man, wound up because of his knowledge of Islam and his language skills in English and in Arabic, was quickly promoted to a sergeant and became a trainer of special forces. That is interesting. 
that a manual from our special forces was helping to train a group of people who were later going to use that information, that training against us. Absolutely. Talk about somebody that infiltrated the U.S. military, Ali Mohammed, was that because Ali Mohammed was also a confidant and a lieutenant of Osama bin Laden at the time. This was only when Osama bin Laden was just a very little light at the end of the tunnel. He was barely known to us in the United States. So he was already moving forward to infiltrate the United States and try to get from us some information that would be useful to them. Some of the other interesting stuff that we found in the 24 boxes, there was a notebook. And in the notebook was a, if you can picture a schematic drawing of a street scene. Picture 56th Street, 57th Street, 58th Street, then you have cross streets. You had 3rd Avenue and 4th Avenue. Then you had little pictures of cars surrounding a bigger car, like a van or a truck, and little stick figures around the stopped car, with actually with people pointing little stick figure guns. It was like a schematic drawing of a potential felony car stop, it looked like. Me and my partner, Lou Napoli, we said, maybe we should try to find out what this is all about. We didn't think it was Manhattan because it had 4th Avenue in the 50s. So we went to Brooklyn and tried to follow the schematic drawing. And we found that the most logical place to start on that small grid was a big tobacco distribution center. We went in there and talked to them and we realized that that was the target because we spoke to the head of security where they got all the cigarettes from Virginia and further south, Carolinas, they would distribute throughout New York some three to four hundred thousand dollars worth of tobacco products to grocery stores and bodegas in the city. They would collect that mostly in cash. This guy that we were talking to, a retired lieutenant from the local precinct, the 72nd precinct in Brooklyn, where that warehouse was located, was explaining to us When we showed him the schematic drawing, he goes, yeah, that's the route I take from this place to the bank. I said, well, the guy who just killed Maya Kahani and his friends seem to be targeting your activities. And he said, well, people are always targeting us because they know we have a lot of cash. I asked him, I said, do you have an armored truck? He goes, no, no, I take it myself. So being a young agent, I only graduated Quantico in the early 88. So I'm only on a job a couple of years. And I'm like, well, what kind of gun do you carry? The guy had his little five shot chief that he could barely open. I said, well, I think you're under a heavy threat here. He goes, oh, well, 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 whatever he said like that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's all the response he gave you? I mean, you have a drawing, a schematic that shows that they plan to attack him to overtake him and to get what he has, even if it means killing him. And he gives you no more response than that? No, no, not at all. Yeah. I don't want to forget, but he was killed in 1992 doing the same route. Wow. And I'll never forget it because I'll get to that point later, but he was actually killed by black Muslims. So that information was floating around in that whole cadre of folks. I remember very distinctly when that happened. I'll try to explain that later. He was murdered as he was moving the money from that very van that we talked about to the Citibank on 4th Avenue in Brooklyn on 56th Street or so. Oh, that's very sad to hear that he didn't heed the warnings. He did buy a 9 millimeter pistol and he did shoot one of his assailants before he was killed. It's a sad story. That's just one of the things that started to Even before that happened, two years later, we started to see that Nosir was much more than we thought he was. After talking to more sources that we were developing, we found out that Nosir had been quite busy before he murdered Maya Kahani. He was experimenting with small pipe bombs. There was an unsolved bombing at a gay bar called Uncle Charlie's in the Greenwich Village area from April of 1990, where he had placed a small device, probably more like a glass jar filled with gunpowder with a cigarette on the end of a cannon fuse, put it in a bar on the floor under the table that he was sitting at and walk away. 
We also found out through a source of a source that he had thrown a hand grenade at the Gorbachev motorcade when it came to New York City for the UN General Assembly. And we actually tracked down that information in police records. The hand grenade, from what we were able to determine, you know when you take a soda can and you keep bending it and then you break it in half? What he did was he took a grenade, pulled a pin without letting the spoon activate the grenade, put the live hand grenade back into the can. So he was walking around with a live hand grenade concealed inside a broken soda can. And when the motorcade drove by, he threw the can at the motorcade, but the can did not split apart and therefore the hand grenade come loose. Me and my partner, we scoured intelligence reports from the NYPD intelligence division during that General Assembly event. And there was a report by a police officer who saw a man fitting no Sears description throw a soda can at the Gorbachev motorcade. So it was actually documented in police files. And no one ever found out or discovered that there was a grenade. No. Somebody threw a can at the motorcade and they stood where it was and probably swept up in the garbage. We also found out that he had tried to assassinate Mubarak when he came to visit and was at the Waldorf Astoria, that he had the identical waiter's uniform that they wore at the Waldorf and was walking around the Waldorf Astoria with a handgun while the president was there. Just by the Secret Service taking him out a different entrance than Nosia thought he would be, kind of foiled an attempt that Mosia would have probably gave up his life to try to take a shot at him as he was leaving the hotel. And I'm sorry, I'm not as knowledgeable, but Mubarak is the president of... He's the president of Egypt at the time. Other things that we found out about him, that he placed a small device in the Waldorf when Dan Quayle visited as a guest. The Secret Service found a small pipe bomb, similar to what they did in the gay bar, where it was a cannon fused with a cigarette on top, cigarette went out, never detonated. He was also experimenting with using a beeper back in the days of beepers, using an electrical pulse from a beeper to detonate a bomb remotely. We started to find out all these things. We knew and were becoming very concerned that there was more to this guy. What we were more afraid of was he part of another cell that would continue with these activities. Again, like I was saying before, our source coverage of that cell was tough. Not only did we dump all the toll records of El Said Nofsir's phone, the NYPD did also. So we had dozens and dozens of good leads to go interview people that Nofsir was most in contact with. From the telephone dump of his phone records, we kind of were able, and plus our peripheral sources, we were able to come up with a five or six persons that were closest to Nofsir. So we started to go and interview them. Is there an NYPD squad that is still looking at it as just a murder while you are now looking at it as international terrorism? And are there any conflicts of who's going to be interviewing who and any crossover issues? I don't recall any major conflicts with the working detectives from the case. We were doing our interviews. They were doing their interviews. Their interviews were being done in preparation for the murder trial that was going to take place at the state level. And me and my partner were looking to see if there was more of an international terrorism nexus to this. No, Sarah worked for the state of New York for the actual court systems. He was an electrician and he had access to a room, you know, with the tools, a tool room, and it had a metal shop and a grinder. And the gun that he used to kill Kahani, for example, he had tried to fit it with a silencer, so he had ground off, the last one inch of the barrel was ground off because he was trying to make a silencer for the top. When I went there with the detectives, I saw all the grinds on the floor and on the wheel. And I remember telling the detectives, I said, wow, shouldn't you take the grinder and the trimmings, match it to the gun? He goes, nah, we have him cold. We don't need that. I said, are you sure? And I only had two years. I go, well, well, these are detectives from New York City. They should know what they're doing. They never swept up those particles or the wheel. I always thought that it would have been a great way to connect the gun to him in that place because, believe it or not, he was later acquitted of killing Maya Kahani due to lack of evidence. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wait a minute. He's running down the street. He's commandeering cabs. 
He's shooting a postal police officer and they don't think that he was the person responsible for shooting and murdering this guy in the Sheridan. Right. Well, he was able to get two. They were good lawyers, I have to say. Kuby and Kunstler, they were able to convince the jury. Him shooting from the hip, he practiced that, we found later, at firearms training. He was actually taught to fire from the hip by a police officer from Connecticut who was a Muslim police officer, Albanian descent, was teaching him how to shoot from the hip. And I think he had a plan that he was going to try to shoot from the hip, maybe drop the gun and walk out in the confusion to get away. But during the trial, the prosecutors could not get one person in the room to say that they actually saw him fire the gun. And then there were other counter stories put out that, well, maybe he was assassinated by some of his own people because there was some strife going on within the Jewish Defense League. So they were able to put enough reasonable doubt into the jury that maybe he didn't kill Kahani. Maybe he got scared running out and shot the old guy and a police officer. But he was convicted of doing that. So he got 21 years in state prison for shooting the older gentleman and the police officer himself. Good to know that he didn't get totally away with it. Yeah, but he did not get away with it in the end. We'll see. This is where we're at. We're having trouble. I'm interviewing all of Nosir's close associates, including the future World Trade Center bombers of 93. They're pretty good forthcoming with their whole reasons for fighting in Afghanistan. I learned a tremendous amount of insight from talking to these folks about why they believed what they did, why they wanted to fight in Afghanistan. They were not shy about hiding the fact that they were all about Afghanistan and about fighting for freedom over there and the Islamic cause and who Sheikh Rachman was and why he was so important and what his theories were. It was really a good experience for me. Even though I could never recruit them, they kind of enjoyed my attempts to recruit them and at the same time get into this verbal ideological jousting with me as an American versus them. Let's leave it at that. I just could not recruit any of the inner circle. It was like trying to recruit a made guy. I had nothing on these folks to get them to flip. And I'm not sure they would have flipped even if I had something on them. Louie and I would always discuss what are we going to do about getting a source that could provide more information to determine whether this is really a dangerous group that is going to do more actions here in the United States. While we were contemplating that, the trial had started. If you see some of the photos that I provided, you'll see pictures of people outside the courtroom in New York City holding up signs supporting Osir. So it became like a who's who in that community in the supporting of Nosir for the act that he's done, that he was innocent, that he's being persecuted because of his religion. And on the other side of the street was all the, the Jewish community condemning Nosir for killing Rabbi Kahani. It was a good place to take a lot of photographs of and try to get a handle on who was who in the support system for Nosir. At that time, it was pretty much in the news every day. While this is going on, I got a call from another agent named Nancy Floyd from the counterintelligence division. Being a good agent and wanting to help her fellow agents, she called me and she said, I have a guy that I'm working with. He's Egyptian. He's helping me with the work I do for Soviet counterintelligence. Would you like to speak to him? Maybe he can help you with the Egyptian stuff. He's a retired Egyptian army officer or colonel. He immigrated to the United States. He works at a hotel in uptown Manhattan. He's in charge of security and it's like a jack of all trades at the hotel. Charge of security. He's the engineer for the hotel. Would you like to meet with him? And I said, sure. I mean, why not? And she said he was reliable and enthusiastic and a good source. So we made arrangements to me. Myself and Lou Napoli met the source. His name was Imad Salem. We met him at this tiny restaurant on Broadway up in the 90s. It was so small that the people next to us can kind of pick up our conversation. But you know who was sitting right next to us was a young Kiefer Sutherland eating a hamburger. Here is this famous actor who eventually becomes... From 24... He has no idea. The, he has uh, no idea that he's going to be sitting next to one of the all-time important sources in counterterrorism in history. Do you know if he ever found out or heard that story? Yeah. 
You know why? How he found out in 2008, when I had my own squad as a supervisor, we had a mental health day with the squad at Chelsea. We went to the bowling alley at the end of the day, and I got there about half an hour before my squad. And this bowling alley had like 100 lanes, and there was only one guy bowling. The woman told me, go to lane 37. And I went to lane 37 in an empty bowling alley. And on lane 38 is Kiefer Sutherland by himself bowling. I just looked at him and I said, FBI, don't move, like laughingly. And he started going, what? I said, hi, I'm John with the FBI. So I love your show. It's really good, this and that. He goes, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. And we started talking. And I said, you know, I got a whole squad of FBI agents that are going to be here in about 15 minutes. Do you remember back in 1991-ish, sitting in a restaurant? He goes, yeah, I do. (laughs) He was great. He was joking, right? (laughs) No, I think he did remember it. Oh, really? And and he hung out with me. We chatted about stuff for about 15 minutes. And then as my squad rolled in, you should see them as I got closer. They're looking at me and then they're looking at him and like this perplexed, like when the dog cocks his head look and they're like, oh my God, you're talking to Kiefer Sutherland. And then the whole squad showed up and he was talking about 24. He kind of was the center of attraction for about an hour. They spent with us very gracious, and then he uh, took off. What a wonderful story. So getting back, Ahmad agrees. He said, look, I could try. So we came up with a plan to have Ahmad go to the courthouse and to join the crowd and pretend to be one of the uh, supporters of El Sayed Nasser. If you know Ahmad back in those days, he was in his mid to late 40s. He had the body of a wrestler and a very intimidating looking guy. We came up with a plan, go there. This is the guy we want you to meet, Ibrahim El Gabroni, or Ahmed Sattar, or Mahmoud Abu Halima. These are all no seers in a circle. We showed pictures. If you can meet these folks very peripherally, just get to know them if by chance that happens. He goes there for about two days. On the third day, no seers cousin, the main guy we wanted to get close to, walks up to him and says, who are you and what are you doing here? We wanted to keep his cover as close to the truth as possible. So he says, my name is Ahmad. I'm here to support Nosir to make up for my 20 years of working for the illegitimate government of Egypt as a soldier. And they said, well, why do you want to do that? He said, because what they did to the followers of Islam was criminal, and I'm ashamed of my taking part in supporting that regime, and I want to do whatever I can to help. And then Gabroni asked him, well, what did you do in the military? This wasn't scripted. Sometimes he went off script. He said, well, I was an explosives expert. I trained in firearms. Gabroni said, well, let me have your number and we'll get together. Within a few days, Gabroni invited him over to his house for dinner. They hit it off. Imad knew enough about rudimentary things to intrigue Gabroni, that he had some skills and that he was good in martial arts. So they offered him to drive Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman to Detroit for a three-day trip to host a conference in Detroit, where it was Imad driving a van that we provided with the blind Sheikh and four of his closest associates with our source that we had just developed driving to Detroit. And I would take it that van is also equipped with a electronic monitoring? No, we we do not. No, at that point, see, that's where the problems start. That's how it gets contentious later on. And it goes like this. Once he got involved with Nosir's cousin, Ibn El Gobroni, he got involved with Mahmoud Abu Halima, and he was quickly introduced to El Said Nosir, who was being warehoused at Rikers Island. So he would go with them to visit Nosir, and Nosir was pushing these guys to continue the jihad here in the United States. Our source would come back to us and say, They want them to do more activity, not in Afghanistan, but here. We started to report daily on some of the things they would say. The biggest thing right off the bat was they asked them if he knew how to make pipe bombs. And they said, for what? And they said, well, those people from the Jewish Defense League are really still our enemy. And the ones who are coming to trial, we'd like to maybe put one of them under their car. And then it escalated from that. Because the judge, the state judge presiding over the case was Jewish, Judge Schlesinger. They said, maybe we want to take him out too. And then they came up with a hit list of prominent New Yorkers, including New York Senator 
federal senator, Alphonse D'Amato, Dove Hike, and, and they had a hit list of about seven or eight people that they wanted to assassinate, and Ahmad was right in the middle of it. And none of this is being recorded. No, I'm, of course, I'm re we're reporting this up the chain of command. What's happening is our supervisor is very much on board. The people above him are like, well, how do we know this is true? They wanted him to wear a wire. And if I can explain it to everybody out there, he was working for Nancy in counterintelligence matters and was opened up as an intelligence asset. And when he was working as an intelligence asset, he was promised that he would never testify because he was a former Egyptian army officer. His pension was coming in and he had a free appointment in Egypt based on his service to the Egyptian government. He didn't want to be put into a position where he would have to testify. And if you wear a wire, you are compelled to testify when you wear a wire. He said he couldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. And then he got into a confrontation with our superiors over the wearing of a wire and also about expenses. Once he became involved with these folks, he was expected to be with the blind shake because he became his bodyguard in effect. He was supposed to be at their beck and call 24 hours a day. And Ahmad being a former colonel in the army, he wasn't like a person that is going to be like a criminal informant that was locked up for dealing drugs. Now he had to work for the FBI or the DEA or go to jail. He was strictly a volunteer who was working at his, at his discretion. Leisure, at his discretion, that's the word, to help us, as doing us a favor. To be honest with you, he was being treated poorly, like, you do what I say, you shut up, you do this, you do that, you'll take what you get. Myself and my partner and Nancy, we were put in a very bad position of trying to keep him happy and going while fighting against our upper management who were really refusing to go along with what he wanted to do or pay him what he needed to get paid. So if he wasn't getting paid at the hotel, and it was very difficult for him to spend so much time traveling from Manhattan to Brooklyn, out to New Jersey, to the other mosque, and it was taking a lot of time and money. The only way they would pay him was if I wrote up tons and tons of information. It was like almost like a piecemeal type of pay for information versus a salary which was a very contentious concept at the time. It was very difficult on myself, Nancy, and Lou to try to keep him happy and working and productive and being the middleman between management and him. We did keep it going, and he was providing pretty good information to the point where they were saying to him, either you wear a wire or you're going to be fired, which I thought was pretty, to be honest with you, counterproductive and almost like shooting yourself in the foot because here we had the one source that became the blind shake's bodyguard. He was reporting information that was consistent to what the peripheral sources were laying out for us. The guy already murdered the founder of the Jewish Defense League. He had done attempted terrorist acts in the past. They were doing the firearms training. I mean, there were so many red lights, yet they were just insisting and drawing that line in the sand you will obey me or you will be fired kind of ultimatum to him. And at that time, the early part of 92, that balancing act between me and my superiors was taking a toll on me. And I didn't even understand at the young age that I was and the lack of experience, I wish I was a 15-year veteran at the time. I, I would have been able to stand up better, but I tried to play both ways by keeping my superiors happy and trying to keep my source happy. I had nobody to go to that I would have a, let's say, a relationship with that was of a higher rank that I would have done easily as an older agent. So what happened was on June 8th, we were doing a surveillance and I had a headache all day. All of us got out who was going to take the eye of a surveillance. And what I was told is I just spun around, hit the ground, and I started to go into uh, convulsions and shaking. It was up in the Bronx, and the guys helped me the best they can. The ambulance came, and they took me to Montefiore Hospital. And thank God they had a, a stroke center at Montefiore. It turns out that I had a tumor, a brain tumor called a... Wow. It was a malformation of blood vessels in the brain burst. 50% of the people who get that are dead on the spot. Is this stress-induced? It didn't help all this what I was doing. 50% that survive, 
half of those people have permanent disabilities. So I was blessed to survive. But after I, they stabilized me, I had to actually have brain surgery a month later to remove the remnants of the tumor and all the stuff that leaked from it. I was out for a total of 90 days. And even when I did get back, because it considered a stroke, I was on limited duty, could not drive, could not do a lot of things. So what happened was while I was out, my superiors literally fired him from his position. They said, if you don't wear a wire, you're fired. And I wasn't there. This was in, let's say, July of 92. The source who was friends with the future bombers of the 93 bombing was fired. Wow. Without recourse. When I came back in September, Louis and I said, we still got the pipe bomb plot out there. At least let's try to bring in everybody associated with Nocer under subpoena to put the fear of God in them, in other words. So we got grand jury subpoenas for everybody involved in the case. And we brought them all into 26 Federal Plaza, including the source. So the source would be included in the guys that were brought back in. So we were just hoping at best now to neutralize whatever plot was going on. Out like there. a deterrent. Yeah. Let me ask you a question, because how does the source now back out of his association with these people? He's fired. He's not going to want to continue because he was only doing it for the FBI. Right. That's a good question. And the way he did it was, and it was good because Lou and I were very aggressive in interviewing people. We would interview people five, six times, go back. Even when they said, we're done with you, we would still go back and re-interview them. So he went to Gabroni and Mahmoud and Ahmed. And he said, listen, I'm out. John and Lou were all over me. I really can't continue. I'm out. He said, the FBI is all over me. I want to quit. So they said, okay, brother, if you don't feel comfortable doing this, you're out. When I came back in September, I wasted no time in doing this. And Lou, we brought them all in under federal grand jury subpoena, questioned them. We actually put them one by one in a room. And all those photos that you see, we scotch taped them to the walls. Just for everybody listening, the photos that you're referring to are the photos of the crowds outside of the courtroom that were helping you identify who's who. Right. And the firearms training also, those photos and other surveillance photos. So when they walked in, if they would see all those photos, they would think that the FBI was on them 24-7 and that they would be afraid to continue with anything else. After we did that, I was able to get SO9 our surveillance squad, to bumper lock several of these guys for a couple of weeks. When I say bumper lock, I mean do an overt surveillance. In other words, when they look in the rearview mirror, you'll see FBI car following you. But that couldn't last for more than a week or two. The surveillance teams had to go on to other things. And what I found out, all these guys who we were interviewing over the last year or two, these are all Afghan veterans. They were fighting against the Russians. Even during their vacation, they would take three weeks off from a job to go fight the Russians in combat. And being interviewed by John and Lou and even the detectives, you know how we are in America. It's easy. Just tell them what they want to hear or lie or if they have nothing on you. It's not like Egypt. In Egypt, if you lied to the Mukhabarat or their secret police or their police over there, you'd be, in, you'd be hurting. They really had no fear of us based on the way we were doing things. And I'm sorry to say, we lost the source in July, and then an individual shows up in September of that year, only two months later, a guy by the name of Ramsey Yosef joins the group. So we lose Ahmad, and Ramsey Yosef, who is the mastermind of the 93 bombing, takes our source's place. That name and is very familiar to those who follow terrorism. Right. So if you don't think I don't think about this all the time, I do. Because I always wondered if, if Ahmad had been there and Ramsey shows up and they had diverted, of course, Ahmad would have been, they were considering him the guy to make the pipe bombs. He would have never let it have gone that far, regardless of what he wanted, uh, testifying. If he had been there and got wind of the plans for the World Trade Center, and it was stopped before it was even put together, would it have become such a viable target for 9-11? In other words, 2.0. They did it once, and they're going to do it again just to prove a point. So if we had quietly stopped it, would it have been an issue eight years later? 
Monday quarterbacking. What could have been, what would have been. Right. So what happens was we lost the source. The source goes on with his life. Ramsey Yosef shows up. He comes with two accomplices. One of them is caught at immigration and is detained throughout the whole time. We're going on with our cases. We're trying to develop new sources, but we're not getting anywhere. So unbeknownst to us, Ramsey Yosef organizes the remaining folks there, and they begin to put together this new device, the urea nitrate bomb, that's going to take down the symbol of American power in the biggest city in the world, the World Trade Center. And he's going to take it down with the thought of breaking it at its core at the base and toppling one building into the other. And these plans are going on, although you're talking to them. They believe that they're under surveillance, but they're so determined to do this that all of that activity is not a deterrent. They are still planning to take down the World Trade Center. Right. If we had been lucky enough to have surveillance 24-7 at that time, we probably would have found them going to some of the safe houses that they used to make the bombs or going to the storage facility that they were storing their chemicals. But the case just wasn't there, in other words. It was just John and Lou. To be honest with you, this should have been from the top down saying, we have to organize a 50-man unit to look at this, not two guys at the time. And why didn't they? They didn't have the vision to see? You know, that's a good question. I've been angry at this whole thing for many years, but I just happened to be reading Foreign Affairs about two weeks ago. They were talking about the U.S. Navy. They were talking about the British Navy also. And in this article in Foreign Affairs, they were talking about who wins the war. They were talking about people who are more visionary or buck the system. Like they said, like Nimitz in peacetime would have amounted to nothing because he was too much of a maverick to get promoted into the highest ranks. They said that in the peacetime Navy, The highest ranking folks just stick to procedures and remaining with the status quo, not making waves. And therefore, people are not ready for war. And I read that saying, well, it's not just the Navy or the Army. It's every every institution is like that. So when I brought this information to my superiors, they were not looking at, oh my God, there's a big terrorist cell in my town. There's never been. Even though New York had problems with terrorists in the 60s and 70s, setting off pipe bombs here and there. They had no concept that this could be so huge with a a big organized cell. But did you? Could you see the enormity of this, of of what could occur? Yes. I thought, my partner thought, I thought, and many others on my squad thought that these guys could eventually become a major problem. So the people at the ground level, the boots on the ground, they could see it. Yeah. The higher ups are a little bit removed from all of that. They just did not have that vision of what was on the horizon. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's a lot of responsibility to take on yourself to still feel today that you wish you had shouted more or yelled more or demanded more. I wish I was myself in my 40s at that time. In other words, I don't think it would have been an issue. Yeah. You would have have made them understand. I would have known how to handle them. So then the bomb goes off on February 26th, 1993. Unfortunately, six people were killed in the blast. I like to say seven because the woman was pretty far along in her pregnancy. I think she was in her eighth month. And now it was who, what, when, where, and how. The FBI gets there, NYPD, ATF, what's going on at the World Trade Center. Could you explain, describe the damage? Did you go there directly? Yeah, I was there within a couple hours after it gone off. Okay, could you describe what you saw? It went off on the, I think, on the B2 level underground. It destroyed three floors below and at least two floors above, creating this big void in the uh, underground parking garage. So what happened was they filled a a rider truck van with about 1,500 pounds of urea nitrate, very powerful explosive. They lit a fuse, actually. It was driven by Ramsey and Mohammed Salome, and they just left it there to go off. If you've seen the World Trade Center in 2001, but to see what happened in 93, the devastation in there, all the cars that were flattened by the overpressure, even though they were floors away, all the stuff dangling from, from the walls, it was quite a sight. All the broken pipes filling in the hole in the floor where the explosion was. 
I heard that crater was about five stories deep. Yes, it was. Going down three, going up two, all in all about five stories, six stories, devastated. From what I remember and understand, all of that is wrapped around the center core of the way the building was built. The sway, from what I remember, it would sway normally six to eight inches in the wind, was now swaying two or three feet. I could be wrong. And that some engineers said that left unattended, like bending a paperclip enough that eventually, if it wasn't shored up right away, the building would have collapsed eventually if it hadn't have been taken care of. And I understand also just that it needed to be shored up just so that you could do your investigation to go through all of that. John, we're going to keep talking, but we're going to divide this up into two episodes because we've been talking for a while. And I'm, as you can tell, I'm fascinated. This is just, this is just fascinating for me. So we are going to do a break right now. We're going to stop this portion and continue next week with the rest of the story. And that's the end of part one of the interview with John Antasev. And the next episode to be posted next week John reveals more about the stress and frustration he endured during this six-year-long FBI internal investigation into how he and others handled his confidential source. In your podcast app's description of this episode, there's a link to the show notes on my website, jerrywilliams.com, where you'll find a photo of John Antisov a few images from his PowerPoint presentation, and links to articles and videos about this case, including the Prime Video series that featured John and his confidential source. There are also links to other terrorist and 9-11-related FBI retired case file review episodes. I hope you enjoyed the interview and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. You can show me just how much you liked it by buying me a coffee. There's a link in your podcast app's description of this episode, or you can visit jerrywilliams.com and tap on the little coffee cup icon in the bottom right-hand corner of my website. Don't forget to follow FBI Retired Case File Review on your favorite podcast app. Now, this podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, Once a month, via my reader team email, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, a colorful list of more than 70 books about the FBI written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There's nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. You'll also get my FBI reality checklist where I debunk 20 cliches about the FBI and receive news about what I'm up to and about my FBI nonfiction and crime fiction books. I want to thank you for listening to the very end. I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.